on in, everybody. Welcome to Manage Smarter. I'm Audrey Strong, the Vice President of Communications here at Sales Fuel. And boy, do we have a guest today, Lee. Well, yes, we do, Audrey. I'm C. Lee Smith. I'm the President and CEO of Sales Fuel. So tell me about this guest. It is Tevis Trower. Hi, Tevis. Thank you for coming. It's such a thrill to be here. It's great. Okay, so if those of you that don't know Tevis, although I don't know how you could not know her because she's got an amazing footprint out there for all of you to research after you see the show. Founder and CEO of Balance Integration and author of The Game Changer's Guide to Radical Success. Get a copy of that. And by the way, her Amazon reviews, they're like all five stars. They're nothing but five stars for that book. Uh, Tevis knows that building a great organization begins with cultivating true greatness from the very top. She is a pioneer in optimizing corporate cultures and has been heralded as a corporate mindfulness guru for the new millennium. She's coached high performance and top executives for powerful organizations, basically Fortune 500s, right? Tevis, you were saying the the big guys, Disney, uh, KKR, to leveraging their most precious asset their humanity. So we're going to get real about how to find your inner truth today. And uh, Tevis, where do we begin? I mean, it's, you got to do the work. Well, it's, it's, um, it's such a zeitgeisty conversation, right? (laughs) Talking about it. And we all get on our Zoom calls. For a while, we were going around our conference room tables and talking about it. But now we're getting on our Zoom calls. We're all going, yeah, we all need humanity. But, but we think that we can outsource that, right? To either a chief cultural officer, chief people officer. Like, like we have a secret fantasy that that doesn't mean that we have to do work ourselves. And um, that's really the point, I think, of entry for any executive to say, what kind of work am I doing? Where are the gaps in my experience? Because the minute your head's nodding, usually it means you've got some work to do too. Like if you're getting uncomfortable, then you're like, oh. That's how you know. <laughs> right? <That's> exactly. <laughs> we were just saying that before you popped into the room here. I said, uh, I said, okay, how do I find my inner truth? And I have, I am the queen of compartmentalization. I will put it in a box and put it up here somewhere in my head and don't make me go there. And then when you need it, you'll be like, oh, crap, where did I put that? (laughs) Well, but but that's what high performers do, is we say, Mm. I've got this entire being and this entire map of my life experience and what is really critical now, right? And a lot of our thinking has come from command and control kind of approaches to getting things done, right? Which we inherited and it's very unconscious because we read all the cool like articles and maybe we've read Eckhart Tolle and we think it's all really groovy. So we don't really get that the operating system that kicks in in the moment of truth is not in support of wholeness. Um, And that that compartmentalization, I think that's a great a great thing for you to know about yourself because once you know it then you're like okay then how do I go back and get those other parts because actually those other parts may have some information that would help me here yeah there's shelves and shelves and shelves (laughs) (laughs) and rooms and rooms rooms. yes go ahead sorry (laughs) I'm curious about your radical success roadmap I want to know how does someone go from being a game player to a game changer Oh, man, after my own art, that is the best question I think I've been asked in a very long time, probably all morning. No, Flattery will get you absolutely everywhere. Best question today. <laughs> you know, um, game players are people who look at everyone else's rules and expectations, and they just keep their head down. They don't want to, they just want to fit in, right? They play it safe. They, they have been pre-installed with all kinds of ideas about what it is to fit in, about what it is to get power, et cetera, et cetera. But very rarely do those people have access to themselves. So because their point of reference is so extrinsically oriented, there's not a strong dialogue for them to ask, well, what do I really think? Because the fact that each of us has a whole world of experiences, a whole life of experiences um, to draw from is really our strength. So when we get all concerned about whatever external judgments, expectations are happening in the moment, we're really sacrificing a lot of our genius. So the moment that we start to become 
a game changer is the moment that we say, oh yeah, 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 I see all that. And I know how to navigate with all that. I know how to play that game, but I'm gonna back up for a second and ask myself deeply, what is the truth I'm seeing? What are the patterns I'm seeing? What's the enlightened path I can make out of this conflict, out of this business deal, out of whatever's happening, right? Because a lot is happening to all of us all the time. And the autopilot, when you're on autopilot, that's when you know that you're game playing, not game changing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's it's also a matter of um, why am I playing this game? Is this the game I should be playing? Is this the game that we should be playing? Should we be be playing a different game altogether? Well, let's talk about the game we're playing. (laughs) So so one of the things I love to invite um, execs to do is to really ask themselves, what when is the last time that you felt so complete, so fulfilled, so happy? And a lot of times they can't answer that question. Now, if I ask them the last time they were pissed off, (laughs) it's like popcorn. Well, there's this time and this time and this time and this time, right? But, but, but when we think about life, right? If, if the whole world, if your life is an arena, and you are the man or woman standing in the arena in the sand, then everything that happens is fodder for you to flex, for you to grow. But the whole point isn't to do so just to win over someone else. The whole point is for you to do so to feel fully alive and to feel that you've fulfilled whatever it is about you that needs expression in this lifetime. Now that's greatness. If we study so many of the great figures in our history, globally, right, throughout history, they've all had one thing in common, that is they are true to themselves, like it or not. It doesn't mean they're great managers, right? It doesn't mean they are, they are um, kind and gentle people, but it does mean that they've been connected with some kind of truth. Does that mean that they're willing to get canceled? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm thinking about Elon Musk. I'm thinking about, you know, Steve Jobs, you know, were alive mm. today. You know, I'm thinking about just people that are willing, you know, and, and quite frankly, there's people out there that are game changers that you don't like because they're assholes. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and they don't care. No, no, they don't care. And I'm not suggesting that to be a game changer, you have to be a jerk. Right. right. There is, there's a level of empathy that has to be a, a present here or whatever. So when I say they don't care, they do care, but you know, they don't care so much that you're, they're going to let that stifle what they need to say. Well, let's talk about the empathy thing, right? Because mm-hmm. I think that that's coming up a lot in corporate corridors and, or Zoom calls. And um, I think that, that it, it, and I'm not a psychoanalyst, right? I don't even play one on TV. <laughs> But, but I think that, that the ingredient and the skill, the muscle around empathy is oftentimes what is lacking in some of the people that we call great. And it's lacking because our culture has cultivated um, a bias towards, honestly, psychopathic behavior. And we've said, if you behave in a bullying way, if you behave in a manipulative way, if you just plow through people, if you use them and throw them to the side and you win, then you are a leader. And that's not what I'm suggesting. The incidence of psychopathy is three is three X greater in corporations than in the general public. So we need to think about that. And wow. then we think about, uh, sorry, I get so excited. If you wanna say something. I was gonna say, no, say, no yeah. that's a, start, a startling statistic, but I don't, yeah, disagree. I look at it as there's a fine line between charismatic and sociopathic. Yeah, 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 absolutely. But but if you think about what drives a high performer to be a high performer, a lot of times it's fear of not getting love otherwise. It's fear of not fitting in, not having a place in society, not being seen as valid. You see these people that are so charismatic and you think, oh, they think very highly of themselves. In reality, though, a lot of them have very low self-esteem. They get all their value from their accomplishments 
on the job. Yeah. You know, so mm -hmm. that's, that's what drives them to be so successful in many cases. And also the fear of not being able to be successful on the job because they put all their eggs in that basket. Yeah, they, they have nothing else. Well, I've coached um, a couple hundred high performers and senior leaders. And that's what led me to create the book is I thought, gosh, if we're so good at customizing ourselves to be successful in that world, then what if we were actually drawing from the strength of our truth, staying connected to self while we are doing that? Because the lack of compassion for others comes from the lack of compassion for ourselves. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, I'm going to ask a question for our audience. Hello, our audience, all of you out there in <laughs> network Radio land. and video land. Radio and video land. Um, so that you say that the book and your program are basically for accomplished professionals who want more through doing this inner work. Is it easier for entrepreneurs like Lee, who have the freedom to make themselves into whatever iteration they want, is it easier for an entrepreneur to do that than for somebody who's working for somebody else where you are within the constructs of an organization and a company culture and you have to follow those guidelines? That's a great question. That is a great question. And I think the knee jerk would say, well, sure, because you're your own boss. Right. But I'll tell you what, <laughs> I've been my own boss for almost 20 years. And you always have a boss. Mm -hmm. you have Many bosses. You, yeah, you have a ton of bosses. And the, he, he, here's what concerns me about that kind of paradigm, right? Oh, well, you can do that because you don't have a 401k. You, you know, you don't have people you have to report to where you've got the freedom to self-express, et cetera, et cetera. We always want to make an excuse and say, well, it's easier for them because... Mm -hmm. So I want to switch that question right now and say, isn't it important for everybody? Mm -hmm. Like you've got a yeah. heart, you've got a soul. As far as I know, we only get one shot. What are you doing with this lifetime? Because whether or not you decide to work for someone else or stay working for a huge organization, small one, whatever, isn't it your responsibility to be true to this life that you've been given? And in doing so, aren't you going to be a better leader? Aren't your contributions going to be more worthy of a legacy you could be proud of? Yeah, that's why I asked the question, because I want people to understand that your program and your book is for everyone mm -hmm. and to not yeah. put themselves in a box. Oh, Go I'm back to that again. Putting box boxes. Oh. This. Yeah, you're so good. Um, you're really right. And the superhero syndrome, or well, they can do that because that's part of why I started um, this game changer chat. I started is, is I started to realize it's so easy to see other people and to discount the hard work they've had to do to be the amazing person they are. Right. So I've had like an ex con, I've had the founder of Conscious Capital, I've had all these folks. And basically my message is anyone that you see that you admire and respect has worked really hard and not just externally, but internally to be that human being. So, so that old quote, be kind for all you meet or fighting a, way, a brave uh, battle, right? That's been attributed to like everyone. I think Audrey actually coined that phrase. Oh yeah, okay. <laughs> sure, probably. Yeah, that works for me. <laughs> but, but, but the reality is, when you meet someone that you admire, instead of assuming it's been easy or they've had it handed to them, ask them, like, what have you had to go through to, to put that all together, to figure that out? Because it's not our wins that enlighten, right? It's the struggles to get to the win. Mm -hmm. I want to give the audience here some takeaways. And I'm going to change the metaphor from the box in the attic to the junk drawer. We all have them. Admit it or not, we, we all have the junk drawer. So you say that the first step on this radical success roadmap is to disrupt. So I'm going to disrupt something right now. I'm going to take that junk drawer out and I'm going to dump it on the table. And so the junk drawer represents your personal junk. And 
you have to ask questions upon, you know, to decide what you're going to do with each, each piece of junk. And each, you know, it's like, why do I have this? Why do I need this? Will I ever need this again? What can, what can I use this for? Who could I give that to? So what are some of the game-changing questions that you advise people to ask when they're going through their own junk drawer and, and they start with disruption as their first step on their success roadmap? Two of my favorite questions, right? It's super, super simple. Am I living or just existing? Like, am I truly living? Am I truly thriving? Am I participating or am I just getting through? And all of us have days and moments that we truly feel that, oh my God, I'm just getting through. But I'm saying in general, is your default. I am alive. I am thriving. I am participating. I'm vital, right? That word vital is just so awesome. It means full of life, right? So am I living or just existing is one of my favorite questions. The other one is, is change truly possible? And one of the places I love to encourage people to go to look at this is their own lives. Because there are ways in which there are constants. And those constants are generally kind of signs, road signs to the person that we truly are. But it's how that person shows up and changes. Like if you broke your life down into 10 year, five year uh, periods and you look at how much you actually change and not just in your young years, but 30s, 40s, 50s, how much evolution is going on? The deal is if you're gonna game change, that evolution starts to be conscious and you start to be actively participating in how you evolve, which is not a bad way to go. But those are two of the most powerful questions. The cynicism against ability to evolve is what we have to guard against. So let me tell you what mine is. My resolution for the new year, Audrey knows this one. Oh, this is a good, I like this. Yeah, so my litmus test, you know, as I'm going through my junk drawer, it's like, is it making me money or is it making me happy? Because if it's not, getting rid of it. Out the door, goodbye, so long, see ya. Don't need it because it's only weighing me down and, and, and it's keeping me you know, from being agile enough then to make the changes I wanna make. Or I'm just gonna say no. I'm not gonna take on that extra baggage. You know, it's like if you're not making me money, making me happy, helping other people makes me happy. Yep. You know, obviously help supporting my family makes me happy. All those types of things, driving my car makes me happy, stuff like that. But, you know, it doesn't fit those two criteria. What, so based on your experience, what do you think about that? Well, I guess my question would be, what if it makes you money, but it makes you unhappy? Yeah, then it becomes a question of how much mm. money. <laughs> <laughs> That's it's when his head explodes. That's that, what that, that is. That, now, that, that becomes a conundrum though. I mean, like, it, it is definitely, you know, that's, that's an issue, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, if it's making me happy, that's not making me money, that's easy. But, you know, the flip, that, that's a great question, Tavis, because that's, uh, yeah, that, that's a matter of what's the cost. Well, yeah. and the discomfort, as we started out the, 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 the segment, um, saying the discomfort is always the entry point into the aha. Mm. Always. Mm -hmm. so, so what I would do in that case is I would say, what, what is truly making me unhappy about this? Because usually... There is some self-betrayal involved mm. if we are not happy. And a lot of times we can remedy that without throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah. Well, you've, you've given him some, you got to, you thought you had the perfect sorting system, Lee, and now you got to go back and figure out that option. He'll be up well, at three in the morning. There's always nuances. <laughs> it's never, you know, all of us consultants and all of us book yeah. writers and everything like that, you know, we like to speak in these short sound bites and everything like that. So because it gets people's attention, makes people think. But the thing is, there, everything is nuanced. There's always little nuances here and there or whatever. And you just can't sum it up in a bumper sticker or, 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 or a Twitter tweet. It's like, it's, it's always deeper than that. Oh my God. People say to me all the time, well, well, is this a proven formula? And I'm like, you're a complex human being. How could I ever? I don't want an algorithm applied to me. 
do you want an algorithm applied to you? Because it defies your complexity. It defies your genius. So wouldn't you rather just have some tools that, that, that give you space to be the complex human that you are and step forward into the world and game change from that? I love it. Balancedintegration.com, everyone. And the best Twitter handle on the planet, I think, at Corporate Yogi. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's awesome. Facebook is Balanced Integration. And Tevi, uh, Tevis Trower is the LinkedIn, just a direct name for that. Is your dance card full or are you looking for new clients and how do you want people to reach out to you? Okay, a couple things going on. You can reach out to me at uh, Tevis at Balance Integration. I've got a mastermind coming up. Um, I keep them super small because I give a lot of personal attention. I am looking for um, senior level coaching clients and leadership alignment work um, so that we can stop just nodding our heads and actually start building the cultures that allow all humans to thrive. So I'm in. Call yeah, me. S- start by turning your camera on in the Zoom meetings. Start to- <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> this was great. I learned a lot. I'm, I'm so appreciative of your time and I hope the audience has got some good tips. So thank you. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure.